Good morning, everyone. I have the privilege of introducing our keynote speaker for today. Our keynote is Dr. Roland J. Thorpe, Jr. Dr. Thorpe is a professor in the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society. He's the founding director of the Program of Men's Health Research and deputy director of the Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions and co-director of the John Hopkins Alzheimer's Disease Resource Center for Minority Aging Research. Today, Dr. Thorpe will lead us into our first session discussing diversity in Alzheimer's disease research, the role of a reg research registry. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thorpe, our keynote speaker this morning. Welcome, Dr. Thorpe. Thank you. Good morning. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Can, can you hear me, uh, Daniela? Okay. So good morning. I want to say thank you to the organizers of the conference for uh, inviting me. I'm very excited to be here today to discuss with you. I want to spend some time with you talking to you about what I believe is a very, very important um, topic in Alzheimer's disease and related dimensions research, uh, talking about the role of uh, the potential role of research registry in being able to reduce disparities and overcome some of the barriers that some uh, racial ethnic groups uh, some racial ethnic groups why, why they do not participate in research. So what I will do this, I'm going to do this in uh, three chunks today. So the first one, I'll talk, I'll describe basically the disparities of just to provide some context for, for us, but I think all of us are aware of this. Then I'll go into talking about some approaches that I believe uh, could help us advance the understanding of disparities in ADRD. And then I'll talk, close out talking about the importance of research registries and how they can help us achieve our goals. All right, so we know Alzheimer's disease and uh, related dementias are a major public health problem. And we don't, I don't see that being, that problem being resolved anytime soon in the near future because the burden of Alzheimer's disease is large and it continues to grow. Um, there are about uh, over 5 million adults um, with uh, Alzheimer's disease and about one in nine of them are 65 and older. And then a third of them are 85 and older and, and then two thirds of them are women. So this, this um, composition of people with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia creates a major problem and problem for, the, uh, for society as it relates to thinking about how it could impact healthcare, healthcare costs and health and well-being of not only the, the, the people with um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementia, but also caregivers as well. So in addition to this, we know that there are some stark disparities that exist between uh, racial and ethnic groups. In particular, we know that African Americans and Hispanics have higher rates of ADRD compared to their white counterparts. African Americans, on the order of two or more times, likely to have um, ADRD than uh, whites, has, and then Hispanics are one and a half more times more likely. So, how do we think about going about addressing the um, addressing these disparities. One popular approach in addressing these disparities in ADRD is that um, addressing them through the social determinants of health. And then when we say social determinants of health, these are conditions in which people live, work, grow, and play. And we want to think about how those, how to address those conditions. If we can address those conditions, perhaps we can improve the health and well-being of the people who belong to racial or ethnic minority groups. The idea, as we all know, is that there's this huge overlap with people of color living under despondent conditions in, in a number of these five areas that the CDC, um, Office of Disease and Prevention Health Promotion, has put forth as key social determinants of health. One key factor I wanted to, I want to bring to light is that when we think about um, factors that influence health, 80% of these factors are factors that don't in that do not occur in a healthcare setting. And that's really, uh, that's really astonishing to me. And I think we need to, people who do research need to be more mindful of this because we think about people going to the doctor and think about them getting diagnosed and treated. But then after we think of, after that, there's little or has been little conversations or little research to, 
think about how we move forward to addressing this because often we know all of these are entangled together and so to not to not to isolate just the healthcare encounter i don't think that's going to do bold as well anymore we need to think about the the environment in which the individuals are living in and the and, and that environment constrains their health behaviors and their health choices and then the socioeconomic factors absolutely put them on different trajectories as it relates to uh, the physical environment and the health behaviors. So taking this all together, taking all of this in together to think about all the factors and how they influence health and well-being is very important to when we think about how we want to address these disparities that that are before us. And so thinking about when we think about moving forward with research, we should think about how to include as many of these as possible to get a more comprehensive viewpoint uh, and more comprehensive evidence base to inform us how we can think about having diversity in Alzheimer's research. But, you know, indeed, when we think about moving forward to um, address these social determinants of health, one of the key things uh, that undergirds these uh, community uh, social determined health is racism. So on, in order to move forward to achieve health equity <clears throat> in aging and dismantling, we must dismantle the structural racism because the structural racism does undergird the social determinants of health. And as they undergird these social determinants of health, it keeps these structures at bay for some certain groups of people while others still uh, are free and are privileged from those uh, undergirdings of the social determinants of health. So just as a reminder, when we think about achieving health equity, you know, we're thinking about give, have everybody having the same fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible and live as long as possible free of ADRD. And so we want to be able to think as such, removing the structural racism requires us to think about how we can remove obstacles to health, such as poverty, lack of access to um, good jobs with fair pay and quality education and these things. And so we think about these things because a number of these things have already been related to early, uh, related to at least cognitive and cognitive decline on the continuum of cognition to ADRD. So when thinking about those things, we need to be mindful that it undergirds, racism undergirds that. And so are we really doing when we think about research and advancing our research now, how can we think about creating the evidence base to inform policy change that may move us toward eliminating this uh, structural racism that exists? I wanna just point out two examples here that was from the uh, 2021 special report, the Alzheimer's uh, Foundation, whereby um, relatedly to structural racism, they did point out uh, that here, they pointed out that more than 50% uh, excuse me, more than one third of the, um, more than one third of black Americans and nearly a fifth of Hispanic Americans and 19% of uh, Asian Americans believe that discrimination would be a barrier to receiving Alzheimer's care. So this points directly to thinking about how can we think about addressing this issue of discrimination being and removing discrimination to being a barrier to Alzheimer's care. Another example that came out of the report and another report is that um, half of Black Americans exp uh, report experiencing healthcare discrimination, and at least a third of Native Native Americans and Asian and Hispanic Americans as well. So we see many of the racial ethnic groups here; they have experienced uh, racial and eth ethnic discrimination when seeking healthcare. So how do we overcome that? Because if we don't overcome that, this problem of trying to reduce disparities or address disparities in ADRD, for example, in our case here, it becomes increasingly difficult if we don't address these types of things. And it's not easy to address. Uh, it's, it's because it's very difficult to try to have these conversations and try to move things forward. But we have to, we we no longer are at a place where we can just not pay attention to this. We have to deal with it head on and we have to address it. We have to find ways to address it. And we could talk more at the question and answer period about some of the ways in which I think we could, could address some of this. And it's not gonna be easy and it has to be buy-in on different levels. But I think it's very important for us to think about and continue to keep this in mind when we think about if we're trying to eliminate or, or, or achieve you know, health equity as it relates to ADRD. 
we have to be able to think about these hard and have a difficult conversations and messaging and how do we move forward to to better achieve equity for everyone. So <clears throat> now that I've set the context for this, uh, describing Alzheimer's, of which many of you are already probably familiar, I want to move to the, the the crux of what I think the conversation should be about in today is to, to talk about approaches to what I believe to advance our understanding of disparities in ADRD. And um, as um, Dr. Freeman mentioned in my um, introduction, most of my work is on Black men's health. So the examples that I use Uber for are largely going to be around the context of Black men's health. And I, I always like to uh, put this quote in. I'm a big fan of this book, The Invisible Man. One of the, this, I'm not going to read the quote to you, but the, the line in red is what keeps me motivated to do the work that I do. And it's, it's, it's hard work but I, I view it as a labor of love because black men have some of the most horrific health profiles and there's a lack of infrastructure in place to compare it to other groups to address these and monitor the health and well-being of black men. So I see this as being a social problem and not only as a public health problem, but as a social problem. And in the context today of AD, uh, ADRD, I wanna talk about these four approaches to increase, so what I think will increase diversity and ADRD research. The first one I want to start off with, we need a better under, better representation of um, underrepresented minorities in research. So uh, we've been knowing this for a while. The question becomes, how do we expand that representation? One of the things I like to say here, and I like to pause and say it for a moment, you know, we, we often, I hear the term all the time that um, uh, they say populations, typically populations, these are hard to reach populations, are difficult to reach. I would ask you to join me in this crusade and stop saying hard to reach population because we're stigmatizing the population. I don't view them as being hard to reach. I view them that we just don't know how to reach them. And I think if we have better, if we have resources to better understand how to reach them, then we would be in a better place. So I, for an example, when we think about black men being in health research, this is just an example of the National Health and Interview and Nutrition Survey uh, of 2018. And this is just a breakdown of the count of just raw numbers of black men in that year of, of men of different racial and ethnic groups across that year and are broken down by different age groups. And as you can see, when we start to really think about, there's only 1,015 non-Hispanic white men and 634 uh, non-Hispanic black men. And then when you start to think about the older black men, this, these numbers start to get really small fast. And so with these small numbers, it becomes increasingly difficult to think about understanding any, trying to address any research question, let alone trying to address something like cognition or ADRD, of which black men typically, um, many of them typically have difficult time enrolling in those types of studies because of the uh, because of the lack of awareness and education that's been provided to them about the benefits of um, better understanding ADRD. So we wanna keep that in mind. And then also I looked at the number of older black males in the health and retirement survey with cognitive impairment by year. And we see that they're, they're starting in 1998. You know, we see that there, it ranges from 288 black men to 428 black men. That's, I mean, this is a sizable number in 2010, but again, it depends on what we're trying to study and what we're trying to understand, particularly if we're trying to understand perhaps some, the impact of some psychosocial factors uh, or the impact of some type of biomarker as it relates on an outcome uh, of cognitive impairment, those numbers could be even smaller. So we need to think about that when we think about having studies. And again, this is just in the context of black men, but this, this same concept can be applied to other racial and ethnic groups. So I think we wanna think about how we increase diversity in Alzheimer's research is that all, oftentimes we think about oversampling blacks and many studies oversample Blacks or the older sample Hispanics or the older sample Asian Americans. But if you don't oversample at the intersection for which you're trying to understand, there's a missed opportunity. In fact, the previous slide in the NHANE study, in the NHANE survey, they do oversample African Americans and Blacks. And this is a clear example with oversampling them, they still have low numbers. 
So the intentionality around specific groups is lost. So I just wanted to bring that point up because I think this is an important point when we're thinking about increasing diversity in Alzheimer's disease research, merely oversampling on a race alone without other identities that you're trying to understand may not yield you the results that you think you, you will get. And finally, I'm working on a scoping review now with some, um, with some of my colleagues and we're, we started to look at the underrepresentation of black men in cognitive intervention trials. So what we, the scope and review is over the last from 2000 to 2020. And we've started, we've looked at, uh, identified 265 uh, cognitive intervention trials. And we have, uh, from that, we found that uh, with applying our inclusion criteria, we've only ended up with uh, including 73 uh, papers in the uh, in our literature review and literature trial literature table, and we found one cognitive intervention trial that had that um, um, one trial that had that could affirm the number of black men in it. All the other trials, all the other of the seventy three had numbers, but they didn't. They had numbers on blacks, but they didn't have numbers on black men. And so um, that leads us to think about, leads me at least, to think about the importance of including in this instance here, black men in cognitive trials, because if we don't include them in cognitive trial, you know, we'll end up, our inability to develop new policies that meets the needs for black men will be impeded. Our inability, we won't be able to ensure the best quality and appropriate types of research, that, uh, types of care that's needed for this group. And finally, we wanna be able to improve the efforts of primary and secondary prevention as it relates to cognition and uh, and on the continuum of cognition when we think about the lack of representation of black men in uh, cognitive trials and research more broadly. So when we think about, when thinking about how to include these, uh, how to include black men, um, there are not a lot of things that are nuanced here. So I don't wanna make this seem like it's just easy, particularly in different parts of the country, when you think about engaging black men and thinking about, uh, not only engaging black men, but thinking about developing a relationship with them or a partnership with them to be able to to be able for them to be in your study. It's really it it's takes work and it's not something that typically occurs overnight. One approach that I've used and an approach that other people use is this idea, particularly if we're trying to recruit people, is this use community engagement. And, and, and with this community, the approach of using community engagement, which is a principle of community participatory based research is that we wanna be able to involve the community and share with these, the community, what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And I use this approach in, in my research and I found that it has been, it has proved to be very valuable for me. You develop the relationship with these men, uh, with the men, in my case, with black men, we developed a relationship and developed trust. Because as you might, as you might imagine, particularly from the South, the uh, black men that you're engaged, particularly if they're older black men, uh, they're going to bring up the United States Public Health Service uh, study at Tuskegee. They're going to bring that up and they're going to want to know how this is different. And there's still some mistrust issues with the mistrust and distrust issues with the healthcare system. And so they want to know, and you want to be able to explain and take time out to develop a relationship and acknowledge it, what has occurred and share with them, at least what I've done is I've shared with the men that I'm not, that's not my goal, that never is my goal. And what I'm doing is a little different and take time to explain what you're trying to do and answer all the questions. And I've been able to do that. And I think that has been very helpful for me. And in doing so, I've, like I've said earlier, I've developed this relationship with a lot of these men that have joined the uh, joined some of my research studies, and once I develop that, it becomes a it becomes a multiplier effect because then they'll go tell their uh, their friends and their buddies about it, and then things start to take off. But if you if you don't take this approach and take what's been horrific in in particularly in, in many at many research institutions, not all, but take a top-down approach where you just go to them and say, this is what I want to do, this is what we're going to do, and I'm coming here to do this, or take the helicopter approach, just go in the community, collect data, get what you can and get out and never engage them. That that has punitive and consequential long-term effects when you're trying to keep people engaged and want the, the particular racial ethnic groups to stay engaged in the research. When Now, there are different types of 
or excuse me, different levels of community engagement that can occur. Uh, and this is just a spectrum of how the people, how people can be engaged in the level in community engagement. And with, with me, I've, uh, and in many of my studies, we, we're typically here um, working with the stakeholder representatives. If we're doing an intervention, they got the intervention development uh, and the Black Men's Health Study that I'm going to briefly share with you later on in the presentation. They helped prepare the actual data collection instrument. They had in, uh, insights into the data collection and large insights into the data collection um, instrument. The other thing I think is very important when we think about increasing diversity in research is when, when building this trust, we need to disseminate the findings back to the uh, to our participants. And when we disseminate it back, don't give them the journal article. Nobody wants to read those journal articles, but as academicians, and we write in a way in such that only we can communicate to one another. When we give back, I think it's very important that we give back in a, in a lay person's term where they can understand the language and they can, not only that can understand it, they can then translate it and disseminate it to other people. I think that's very important. So one of the key things I would say is communication and dissemination of your findings to the group. And if you have, if possible, you could have a community advisory board and, and with your studies to help you disseminate the information and think about how the information to be disseminated to those individuals you know, that are involved in your study. The, the one thing here is when we think about community uh, participatory based research, I think that is so key to when we're thinking about increased in diversity, because there are a number of different principles that, that um, we can use to engage, uh, maximize engagement. So here we think about um, collaboration across all phases of research, and, and uh, there's a commitment to addressing the current concerns that they have. For example, this is key here. Many times we go in and we have our ideas of what should be studied. And oftentimes if you talk to them and you're really engaged and you're true about, you're true to yourself and you're true to the population that you're trying to serve, many times you'll find out that their what their issue might not be your issue. And then now there's some tension. Yeah, you got this grant and you got to get to achieve the goals of this grant. But how can you come to a compromise to achieve the goals of your grant and also help them address some of the issues, maybe not all, but some of the issues that they have. It's you have to find a compromise, in my opinion. You find this compromise and finding this compromise is very key because then now they're involved, they have buy-in, you have buy-in. And I think it just creates for a much easier process, research process moving forward. And along the way, when you're doing this engagement, along the way, create some capacity building for the community members. And watch this, you all, watch this very closely. How about letting them teach you something as well along the way? Because we don't all know all the answers, because if we don't know all the answers, particularly as it relates to that community for which we're trying to engage, and they are the experts in how to engage that community. And oftentimes, we don't necessarily uh, view that in that way. And that could create some consternation uh, as, as it relates to increasing diversity in your research. So be mindful that both parties come with levels of expertise. And to be able to have a partnership where it's bi-directional and not unidirectional. And the dissemination of findings is really important here. So the next uh, approach I like to talk about is this the notion of studying the importance of uh, within group research. So, you know, I when as it relates to where we are in trying to advance uh, our understanding of disparities as it relates to ADRD work, I, I submit on many a number of health outcomes. We know that there's racial ethnic differences that exist in their disparities. I don't think we need to compare on those indicators. I don't think we need to compare, do any more comparative. I think we need to move to the next step, which is either study within groups, study a particular population, study within that group to try to understand the pathways and mechanisms of um, and how they operate to help the ADRD. If we improve that, the thought process, if you improve that group, then those differences may, should go away or should be reduced, not necessarily go away. So we want to think about how, how we can move from just comparing and everything doesn't need to be compared. And there's, then there's this whole notion of philosophical differences of what should be the reference group or the comparison group. 
It's always been, oftentimes it's been the default of being the white group. But that's not necessarily, or should not necessarily be the case all the time. And we can have some conversation around that in the in the Q and A because I think it's extremely important to um, to understand that there are sometimes some groups that do better th than whites. And if we're going to do a comparison group, should they be considered the group? I know this is difficult to think about and difficult to wrap your head around because we we have been conditioned so long in this research. You got to compare it to white people, and that's not necessarily the case. And then I argue on many of these health and indicators, you really shouldn't be doing a comparison group if we're trying to better understand that group, because there's more heterogeneity between within groups than there are between groups. We've learned that from the Human Genome Project. So one example I want to briefly go through is the example of the health, uh, the Black Men's Health Project, which is a project that myself and uh, colleagues from Tulane, Dr. Lavise and Harold Neighbors are working on. We have a online survey that we're, that we're in the field. Our goal is to um, recruit 5,000 men 18 years or older. We're getting closer. I think we're about 3,500 black men who've engaged and completed some part of our survey. We're excited about this. One key thing that we found an example of what I want, I want to highlight this example. These key determinants of health that I have, black men's health that I have on the screen, we identified many of them from the literature and others we identified by having a conversation with uh, focus groups around the country, around four key areas around the country with black men. And so, and some of these uh, concepts may uh, are included in our survey, which the black men around the country help us put together the survey. So we're very proud of that. And we're excited about the things to come. Just wanted to show you an example of uh, some of the work that I'm doing that is that has had to be a community engaged up front and um, engaging them and building an instrument. And we're once we finish, we're going to disseminate the information out to all of the um, members who all of the members who are enrolled in the study in a in a meaningful way to uh, communicate with them. They will not be getting, if they, upon request, if they want journal articles, we will send them, but they will not just send them journal articles. We're going to use different methods of communication that we found to be useful with this group. So I think that's very important to understand and keep in mind. The next um, area approach is this approach of employing qualitative mixed methods research. I think this is very important to understanding uh, when we think about understanding increasing diversity, we need to understand the lived experiences of uh, different racial ethnic groups, particularly as it relates to ADRD. And oftentimes just the quantitative methods won't, is not sufficient. And I think we're likely better off to be able to get some contextualization around some of these uh, online surveys by using mixed methods or qualitative research methods. I think this provides us with the opportunity to think about how we can better think about create solutions because now we're hearing from people about their lived experiences that many times are, are rarely captured when we think about quanti doing quantitative research. So I think we want to keep that in mind and embrace the idea of the richness that qualitative research as well as mixed methods research can bring to helping us achieve health equity, particularly as it relates to ADRD in this space. Now, the last area that I think is very, uh, I think is a, is a very good approach to increasing diversity in ADRD research is what we're all here to talk about today is the use of a research registry. I think research registry, in my opinion, that research registries have been uh, underutilized in a lot of areas. One key area that I think research registries have been used over time is in, in, the, in the cancer world. They've used them a lot over time, particularly I know as it relates to prostate cancer and, and, and breast cancer. Uh, that these registers have been very helpful. Uh, then the goals of these registers may vary, but the overall objectives are you want to provide data to inform program and services, and then that data that you collect can help you think of, help you determine burdens and identify trends in, in health outcomes in our context today, ADRD. And then this information for these registers of what I think one of the key, if two key goals is that you can use this information to inform you know, key stakeholders uh, as it relates to development policy relevant solutions, or you could look at it to think about the needs of the, the future needs of the registry. 
And finally, one of the other things that I think is often underutilized for registries, and I'm so excited that uh, on the agenda later today that there will be some, uh, some, some discussion and workshop around using registries for to foster research and research ideas. So I'm very excited about that. And so one of the things I think about when I think about registries, you know, registries should, when we think about disparities and reducing disparities, I think we want to keep in mind this research framework, disparities research framework, because this research framework that has been adopted by NIA provides us with an opportunity to think about what are some of the factors that we can ask that may not, we may not typically think about asking if we were to do this in the absence of this framework and think about how the synergistic effects of these different, different factors across these different levels of analysis here, how would they help us get a better understanding of just asking rather than just asking questions in one of these siloed areas. So the major point here is to, if possible, think about these different groupings and how can you ask some questions? Now, I do understand that we want to minimize the number of, um, we want to minimize our questions and want to maximize the use of the information we want to get from these registries. So I, I appreciate that, but I just have this here. So when we think about it, if we're going to address disparities, particularly in, uh, you know, on the continuum of cognition, we want to think about a lot of these things do impact and they don't operate in silos. So they operate synergistically to, to produce or to exacerbate these disparities. So thinking about collecting some of this information, not all of it may be able to gain, people may be able to gain some reasonable insight as it relates to uh, addressing these disparities. So I want to now turn and talk to talk about some examples of research registries. I'm, I'm going to talk about, I'm um, going to start with one of the research registries that, uh, that I found out about eight years ago, and it's a research registry that's within the Healthy Black Elder Center. And the Healthy Black Elder Center is a part of the Michigan Center for uh, Urban African American Aging Research. And they have a participant research, uh, research pool that is a database that's open to any of the older African Americans um, that want to participate in research studies on aging. And automatically, when they become a member of the Healthy Black Elder Centers, they're automatically added to the participant resource pool. I think this pool, this is a, this is out of this, this center is out of uh, Michigan. And the, this center has been ongoing for a while and they have, they have over a thousand active participant uh, resource pool members in the study. And the program is really uh, designed to be inclusive, to get anyone healthier. And what one of the key things that they have done and focus on, they have some outreach to build interest in the research and to build trust in research. And that's one of the key things that I mentioned earlier. When we think about increasing diversity, at, at the core of increasing diversity in uh, Alzheimer's disease research, particularly with uh, racial ethnic groups, there, there has been, I think trust is one of the bigger issues as it relates to, to research. And I think they, this, this is just an example. They don't necessarily focus on uh, ADRD, but this is, I think this is an, a, an amazing example of how the, um, this um, Mukwar um, group has created this participant research, research pool and included some of the principles of CBPR to engage the trust of the members in the community and to be, get them enrolled in the healthier Black Elder Centers. I just think this is, a, I wanted to take a moment to point to that and, and to talk about how they've done that. It's been very exciting, at least exciting to me. I think it's an amazing program. I think if you have an opportunity there, you can, I'm gonna circulate these slides and I, they're posted, you'll have an opportunity to be able to look further into this program. It's a very exciting program. Um, now. What I'm excited about as it relates to ADRD is that we have three, uh, today we're gonna hear from three different uh, state-based uh, registries. I'm very excited about them. I'm gonna go briefly over this because I recognize that there'll be very detailed presentations following this, my talk on each of these. I would be remiss 
if I didn't start out with Georgia Alzheimer's disease uh, because I'm from Georgia, I'm from Macon, Georgia, and I'm really excited and really proud that uh, Georgia is taking a lead on doing this. And I don't know if anybody from the Department of Health and on, on from Georgia, but I'm going to ask you to check out my people in Macon, Georgia. If you need some help getting in contact with them, I, 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 can, I, can, I can help with that. Uh, we're a small country town. I think everybody knows everybody, but I'm really excited to learn more about this Georgia uh, Alzheimer's disease registry. And as well as the South Carolina Alzheimer's disease registry, I'm excited about, I've looked at the report and they're doing some outstanding work here. I'm purposely not going into details on this because of the, uh, uh, my colleagues and peers are going to talk about each one of these in the next session. I'm looking forward to these registries and the power of these registries and what can be gained I'm excited about just thinking about what can be gained from these registries, uh, from the work from these registries and engaging. I'm interested in learning how they're engaging and in increasing diversity in each of these disease registries. And finally, uh, my colleagues next door to me, because I'm in Maryland now, my colleagues next down the road from me in West Virginia, I'm excited about the, or hearing the work that they're doing as well in their registry. I think it's important for us to think about and learn in spaces like this that I'm excited that this conference came to fruition. I look forward to it being uh, an annual conference because now we can come together and talk about best practices of engaging different racial, ethnic, or socioeconomic status groups or groups of different uh, veteran status or ability status. How do we get them into these uh, Alzheimer's disease registry? Because after all, we are becoming a nation where the majority will become the minority and we need to be able to I mean, to have research that includes everyone so that the findings that we have will be generalizable to everyone. And I think these registries, these three state-based registries are, are at the forefront and the edge of moving forward and they can be the leaders and exemplar for other states to follow. And I just wanna go back to these key determinants of uh, black men's health when thinking about them, uh, particularly, and this is just in the context of black men, but if you're any other group, that you may be thinking about increasing diversity in your registry. You wanna think about some of those, including some questions or gaining some information around key factors or key determinants of that group. Here, these are some key determinants. And the key determinants, many of them may overlap in place and uh, certainly may overlap in, uh, in across different racial, ethnic, or SES or groups. So just, if we can keep that in mind when we're thinking about increasing the diversity and that diversity should mirror the population of which you're trying to understand. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. And finally, I think one of the things that we wanna be able to do to uh, once we get the, once we understand the, the, have the registries set where we are increasing diversity in our registries, if it's not already being done, make those modifications and, and then the next step, I think, is we want to increase the number of people of color that's doing this work and we want to increase our training and translating this work. And we can use these registries as research to help us think about some of the training and translating that evidence-based research into solutions, particularly on a state level, when we're thinking about these state-based uh, registries. And then we want to increase the community involvement. That goes back, well back to when I was talking about early engaging the community and learning how to approach the community. And here, for this third bullet point, I would, I, if this is not already being done, I would encourage you to have the community people do the training. Who better to show you how to engage the community than the people who live there? I think that's very important and very powerful. And that strengthens the partnership. Um, you know, and think about reframing for those of us who are in academia, think about reframing is all I always see is written as academic community partnership. How about this? Just try this on for Friday morning. How about community academic partnership? Put community and emphasis on the community first, because those are the people who are going to help us work collectively together to achieve all our goals as it relates to trying to reduce or eliminate these disparities that we see in ADRD and all aspects of ADRD and improve the health and well being of the people who have ADRD or the people who are on the continuum cognition to ADRD and or their caregivers. And so we wanna think about how to do that. Now the National Institutes on Aging has put forth some funding to support some Alzheimer's disease focused re, uh, resource centers on minority aging research of which the Carolina Center on Alzheimer's Disease 
and minority Asian research is one of them. And I think they're one of the, I think that they're sponsoring this event today. And I'm, I'm, and I'm a member, as you heard in the, in my introduction, I'm a member of the Johns Hopkins Alzheimer's Disease Research Center on Minority Agent Research. And we have uh, six more centers for a total of eight centers around the country. And the key goal of these centers around the country is to mentor a diverse group of investigators that are in that are interested in minority aging research on Alzheimer's. And at our center, we focus on uh, take health disparities from a life course perspective, not only health disparities, but also minority aging research from a uh, uh, looking at cognitive impairment all the way to ADRD risk and late life. These are key areas. These are definitely key areas where I think work needs to be done and the role of and the role and use of actual registries can be very key to training early career uh, faculty on how to create evidence base or how to even engage the community and uh, community engagement to create projects and studies that may be able to help that community in and of itself to move forward. So I'd like to conclude uh, this is that I think if we need, we're in a space and time in America where we're going to be, we are more diverse and we're going to continue to be the more diverse and with all the advances in healthcare and technology, we are actually uh, the population, segment of popular, older population continue to grow. I think we're gonna need uh, interdisciplinary teams to help address this increase in diversity in ADRD. Community engagement using CBPR principles, I think are gonna be a key to have the potential to influence trust and to develop strong sustaining partnerships over time in that community. And I think research registries are at the, the forefront. They can play an important role key role in increasing diversity of individuals in ADRD research, and not only increasing that diversity, but providing an evidence base for thinking about policy relevant solutions in those particular areas for um, to, to make the health and well-being of people with ADRD and the associated uh, and, and people who care give in that area as well. So I think this is we're an exciting time. And I think this can be done but I don't think it'd be done overnight. I think we have to be intentional and we have to be not only intentional, but we have to be, our efforts have to be concerted and we have to keep moving forward one step at a time. I wouldn't, I, I would not be here if it were not for a list of these people who have helped me for my thinking on a lot of things across my career. I want to pay particular attention to the, all the undergraduate and graduate students and postdoctoral uh, fellows who have helped me over the years to inform my thinking. Here's just a list of funding sources. I'm so thankful for the NIH, uh, particularly the uh, uh, National Institutes of Aging for all of its funding over the years of my career so that I'll be able to uh, be able to create knowledge that, that hopefully is going to move into policy relevant solutions in these areas. And I always like to close out with a quote. I think this quote here is most um, it's most fitting today. It's by James Baldwin. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Let's go engage the communities. I'll take any questions that you have at this time. As usual, Roland, thank you so much. That was really fantastic talk. And I don't know if you intended it to be, but certainly a call to action um, for many of us who are passionate about this work. So again, thank you for all the work that you're doing and have done in this area and really giving us some things to think about as it relates to diversity and Alzheimer's disease research and how to increase that diversity. Um, so I'm gonna maybe summarize a bit some of the things that really resonated with me. And then we do have a few questions on deck, but this will hopefully be a good stall tactic. So if any of you have any other burning questions that um, you need some time to throw in the chat or the Q and A, we're understanding some people may or may not have access to that. Um, please do send those questions our way. So first, um, really important point about truly engaging community, right? So that is definitely something that is not only in word, it is in deed. It is important to develop those relationships and also acknowledge as someone who does work in this area that these relationships take time, right? True relationships. And so you talked about how those things can be um, life-giving and, and they can be multiplicative, right? So you've developed those initial relationships and those can really provide a gateway to future relationships. 
qualitative or mixed methods research really important in the richness and robustness of those methodologies and the, and the type of data that we can receive, and then rounding it out with the use of a research registry and really calling to question things about um, the ways that we've traditionally thought about how to increase diversity, right, oversampling, and maybe even making comparisons based on race. So those were kind of my key takeaways. Obviously, you said so much more, but I do uh, want to shift to a couple of questions. So one question we got in the Q&A was, could you please explain John Henryism in a bit more detail? Yeah, so John Henry is, is a uh, high effort coping mechanism, and it was uh, coined by Sherman James, I think, in the early 80s, and there's a folklore around John Henry. John Henry was a Black man who... Um, uh, he was a uh, worked at the uh, worked on the railroad, and he the story, the folklore goes that he was um, he raced a locomotive steam engine of laying of laying tire um, tire um, forget what they call the tire. I'm gonna call them tire rails for like, and he beat the steam engine, but he beat the steam engine, then he died, he collapsed and died afterwards. So the metaphor is like, well, uh, particularly uh, and with African Americans, that we end up having to cope with a lot of things that are occurring in our life, and this high effort coping can reset new normals on a different different in physiological indicators that can then indeed have negative impacts uh, on your health outcomes. Right, thank you for that. Steel driving man, right? I think that's yeah. the image that I remember seeing. Yeah. Uh, but I forget what he was driving. I forget. That's what I was trying to figure out. What it is? It's the tire. It's not a tire rail. It's something in the in the railroad. I can't remember what it is. I should know because my father was a, a a railroad engineer. I should know, but I don't. <laughs> All right, very good. So you have a question from Dr. Maggie Miller. Uh, mm -hmm. It looks like I'm not. Oh, sorry. Uh, Dr. Thorpe mentioned engaging the community by sharing study findings. He recommended not just giving out academic journal articles to the community, but tailored materials as well. What materials have you found most engaging and effective? So yeah, that's a good question. So, and that question really depends on your audience. So for me, uh, I, when I was interviewing and doing focus groups with Black men, I, that was one of the questions I, I asked and they wanted information around informatics. Um, they wanted information uh, they didn't want to. Uh, they didn't want a lot of words. They wanted more pictures that could draw their attention. And then once they draw their attention, they wanted few words that had explanations. And so what we did was we went and we got we developed some infographics. Um, and then there were some things that needed to have some messaging around it. And when we had the messaging around it, one of the things we did we went to we have a community advisory board, a community core, and we went to the men in that community core as well as the women and asked them for their feedback on how this would you know, how does this read right or does it make sense? And, you know, of course, you know, they we had to strike out some words that we were using. For instance, I, uh, you know, I thought it was, I thought it was okay. And this is a perfect incident where learning from the community is very important. I wrote, I used the word garnered. And I was like, okay, we garnered, blah, blah, blah. And then one of the community people on our community court, I know very well, he was like, Roland, don't nobody use no word garnered in the community. I was like, okay. And it was a learning moment. Me. I said, well, what, what do y'all suggest that I use? And he said, guard, get, obtain. I said, okay, all right, that's fine. But I wouldn't have never known that. And 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 that's just a perfect example of how to get people uh to get people engaged. The other thing that I know that people have used before is newsletters. Um, and you know, with newsletters, they have, you know, you have a lot of you have uh you have know, minimal words, 75 words to 100 words for each article that, you know, you want to arrest people's attention really quick and get the information there and also have a link to some people want to read more. And nowadays, when the majority of our stuff been digital, you can have a 75 word, 50 to 75 word teaser and then have a link for the for the full article or the full information somewhere else, link back to a website or some resource. Those are some of the things that I've I've used before and um and getting the information out. But I think it's really important that your message is, is, is right on. And so I take very, very, I'm very deliberate and very careful about putting the message out to the community. Because one wrong word could send things in a tizzy and, it, and, and then it takes more time to get that back uh, and get people back on the on, back on their on their square. 
Okay, thank you. Another question, can you describe some best strategies for how to start a new partnership? So you talked about the importance of engagement and developing partnerships. How might someone start doing that? Yeah, so uh, some best strategies that I've that I've used, I think one is if you're going, so if you're going into a community, uh, let's just take take my hometown, Macon, Georgia. So if I was, if I eat me today, even if I'm, I'm from Macon, if I was going into Macon, I would want to think first think about the people who I want to engage in. Who are those key gatekeepers of those people? So for example, you know, I may want to talk to some leaders of churches. I want to talk to them first. I want to talk to the um, people who own barbershops and beauty shops particularly when we think about places where um, African-Americans go. Um, I wanna, may want to talk to some people at different schools, depending on what I'm trying to get done. And I want to have a conversation with them up front, those key stakeholders up front to say, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. And lay out a, a broad plan of what I want to get done and ask for feedback. And who asked the question? What was the name of the person that asked the question? Dr. Ingram. Do you know? That was Dr. Friedman, of course. Okay, okay. So, because I, I want to I address that. Dr. Friedman, then after you do that, it's very important you stop and you listen. Because that's the key. You stop and listen. Because I want everybody to understand that's the important piece. You stop and listen. When I talked earlier and I said, we go in with our ideas, that might not be their ideas. I might go down and say, hey, I got this program I want to do to get uh, young boys and young young girls, African-American boys and girls. I got this program, after school program I want to do around health and sex, right? So we can get increased HPV and all that. So I might go down there. They might not, they may be rolling, that's good. Okay, but this is what we, we want for our, for our children. And so then at that point, I got to stop and listen. And I might not even respond anymore that day. I may have to walk away set up another meeting with them, come back with a compromise, or I have to say, look, we can do that and we can do this. And then once I get their buy-in, and so then, then we need to have, what I've done is I've held town hall meetings. We invite, or we go to different, so there might be something set up at the barbershop or the beauty shops, I go there. There may be something set up at the churches, I go there and I talk. And it's important for you, if you're trying to get engaged in that community, it's important for you to go to their events. Because if you want a true partnership, you're not just in the events because you need their data or you want information from them. You're in the event because you care. You go in there because you care, right? And you just show up one time when there's nothing on the line. Oh, what are you doing out here? I heard Miss Susan sweet potato pie good. I come to get a slice of the sweet potato pie. That goes long ways, right? A long ways, right? And you, I think it's those things that you have to do to build a relationship. That's why it takes a long time to build a relationship. It's, and, and trust me, many of the communities around the country, they can see when people are not being authentic. They can see it, they can see it, they can see it. Now they may be nice to you and you may feel like they, they don't see it, but they, they can see it. And, and, and they know, and they'll have the, you know, the conversations behind closed doors, they know, and they may, they may not, they may help you to a certain extent, but if you're really true and authentic, I think they will go in and the recruitment becomes very easy because they're going to do it. At the meeting, you want them, somebody to introduce you, somebody, one of the leaders to introduce you said, well, you know, and first of all, you're no longer Dr. Uh, Friedman. You're Daniela. Let me bring you to Daniela. And you're not, and I wouldn't wear this tie, Daniela. I would go in without a tie on, without a suit. I'm going in and I'm rolling. And I would sit and I would talk to the people and say, this is what we're trying to do. And it wouldn't be any, we're do, we need to do this because we need to develop policy relevant solutions. It's not that language. It's a whole different language. It's what can we do to make the community better, right? And I think it is very important to be able to engage them and let them understand what you're trying to achieve. And then whatever you can achieve, you need to tell them because you got to manage those expectations. It's a relationship, right? Many of us are in different types of relationships. Think about it. If you got family members, you don't always get along, but y'all have an overall common goal, right? And so it's, it's really no different from there. If you apply some of those principles, I think things will be fine. And, and finally, 
and use common sense. <laughs> use common sense. And then when you're dealing, well, I think that's really key is to use common sense. That's good, Roland. Um, I'm going to quote my husband. He says, but sense ain't always common. So I don't no, no, no. I, indeed, sit, he's a wise man. Sis ain't, <laughs> sis ain't always common and ain't always found in the books either. And see, that, that's the other part, right? That's the other part for us yeah, academicians yeah. who always think the answer is in the book. It's not always in the book. And if it is, you got to have some nimbleness and flexibility to change on the fly. And it's okay if your study design may have to be modified a little bit. It's okay. This is the work we do. Absolutely. So here's a question from a doctoral student. Uh, can you remind us how you solicited the key determinants of health for Black men? I thought that was brilliant to ask your population what their health needs, barriers, facilitators for healthcare were. Sure. So I did that, plus we did a literature review. We went to the literature and we did the literature review and we identified some from the literature review as well as we went, we did that first. Then, but we when we went to the talking to the men in the focus group, we did not ask about those. We just asked them, hey, what are some of your health needs? What do you think are some of the key things that may impact your health? And what are some, and, and what are some of the things that may keep you from going to the doctor? Those types of things. And then we got the we got a lot of different words and things from there. And then we came back and we put the two together. And it surprisingly, surprisingly, there was a lot of overlap. Right. We have another question here um, about earlier in the presentation where you differentiated time to time racism versus regular racism. Can you describe that difference? And um, yeah, tell us a little bit more about that experience. Time to time. What was what, what was the question again? Yeah, let me let me read it. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Early in the presentation, the evidence of the high rates of racism experienced by ethnic groups reported that all groups experience time-to-time -time racism more than regular racism. What is the difference? Is time-to-time -time racism resulting from more structural racism or is it regular racism? It seems like reducing that large segment of those experiencing racism would be very helpful and it might reduce the other types of racism. So I think we froze. I didn't hear your last, last part. So what was the last part of the sentence, the question? It seems like reducing that large segment of those experiencing racism would be very helpful, and it yeah. might reduce the other types of racism. Yes, indeed. I, I, I agree. I totally agree. So that's one of the big things, though. The question to me is, and I'm glad you brought this back up, the, that, that was powerful when I saw that, the time to time versus the, uh, so to me, it looks as acute versus chronic, uh, that's, that's, that's what it looks like. Uh, that's what I think about the time to time in the uh, regular is that acute versus chronic. But I, I think either one of the situations need to, both of them needs to be eliminated in my opinion. And so the question that I think we need to uh, think about is how do we address that? And there's, I mean, how do we address that in a system where the, where racism is, is a combination, structural racism rather, is a combination of complex structures operating together, right? So how do you really get in and make an impact on that, right? There are a number of different uh, perspectives on how do you do it. You know, <laughs> I've talked to people that, that, that range from, let's just burn the system down and start all the way back over. Uh, and then there's others that say that we have to start thinking strategically thinking about which ones we want to address first and then move forward from there and then there's others that we need to present a you know most of the cases on structural racism are presented from a social justice or moral case which i think are very important but i've also think another case can be very powerful a financial case right if you present a financial case and say that we, you, you don't have to address structural racism, but you still spend an X amount of money. Structural racism still, the government or whomever, the organization is still spending X amount of money for not doing it. That may raise different eyebrows, right? Because some people, some people are motivated by the social justice and the moral uh, approach. And others are motivated by, by, by finance, is in money. And so I think being able to do both is really important. But I do, I do appreciate your question 
that, and I, I agree, I think that we have to think about how to eliminate both of those, um, because if not, those are the people that we want in the study that won't be in the study because they have these bad experiences. And, the, and it could, those experiences could be nothing related to what the re research you're trying to cover, collect, but they know that they've had these experiences and it's gonna be very difficult to try to en en enroll them. I'm not saying give up on them, but I'm just saying if they bring it to you, you know that it's gonna be, it's gonna be an arduous task. Not, I don't think it's an insurmountable task, but it's gonna be an arduous one. Thank you. I'm gonna ask um, a question. You, you mentioned that there may be opportunity to discuss this further, but I am interested in your thoughts about comparisons to, so if we're talking about minority group or minoritized groups and making racial comparisons to whites as a reference, for example, right? So you brought up um, Dr. Whitfield's paper, right, about that comparisons. And so kind of what are your thoughts about doing research where we're making comparisons to other racial and ethnic groups when in fact maybe our true interest is with the minoritized groups? So, yeah, this is a very good question. I, um, my take, my perspective is, is this, is, you know, I think uh, Dr. Stephen Thomas wrote a paper in the early 2000s or mid 2000s on these different levels of stages of, of moving through advanced, uh, advanced in healthcare, health disparities research. And my, my, my take is really on if there's an outcome, let's take let's take the obvious one: hypertension. We don't need. We know black people, Hispanic people. Uh, we know that there are differences in prevalence rates, right? And those differences may be largely due to social disadvantage, which would make that a disparity. We know that. Um, there's evidence there. So why do we need another study to compare those groups, right? I argue that if we know that information is there, that we should move to the next stage. And the next stage could be trying to understand why that group, that typically the minority, the, uh, the racial ethnic minority or the low NCS group, why, that, why does that they have higher rates? Understanding why they have higher rates, developing solutions or help promote strategies to minimize those rates. If you think about it, if you do that, then the, then you would think that the difference would go away. But I don't think we need to continue to do differences on the, to document differences and disparities on comparing whites to blacks when we already know, because I think you stigmatize that you, you further stigmatize the minority group and my, from my perspective. Now, I also think we, we did a paper about nine years ago on the economic burden of, uh, of uh, men's health disparities. And one of the things we did, we got a lot of flat for it, but one of the, but we finally got the paper published. One of the things we did was we looked at the rates of um, that was, excuse me, we looked at the prevalences of different health conditions. And we took the group that had the lowest and made them the comparison group. So some of it was Hispanics was the comparison group and some of them whites were in some and um, blacks were in some. And so we made those the comparison group. And then philosophically, when you think about comparing groups, comparing whites, to particular, particularly if you're in the U.S. and you're comparing whites to blacks, is that really an even comparison? You could, you're not, you got an apples to oranges comparison on a number of different reasons. Philosophically, you compare privileged to non-privileged, oppressed to not oppressed, right? But then you want to say that these differences occur. Yeah, they occur because systems have been in place over the years to keep them at bay and to keep them there. And so no, there's no design that you're going to put in place that's going to take away that because we're not measuring it. That's for those doctoral students, those are unmeasured confounders. That's what we call them. And so you're not going to get rid of them by doing that, but nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody wants to have conversations around that, but you're going to constantly say that we should compare it to white groups versus black groups or white groups versus uh, other racial ethnic groups. But we know that there's typically, typically there is this privilege in place that no one wants to talk about. Right. And, and none of that other stuff that's unmeasured to say that when we see a difference that we should have been comparing them anyways. Right, I think that's the real. I think that's the real piece philosophically. For me, that's the piece, and, and and others. I know we're out of time, and others may have different. Others may have a different viewpoints, and I would love to hear the viewpoints because I like I like to learn about these different things. I blame myself. That was a heck of a question to end to put at the end of your talk. But thank you so much again. 
um, for your time today. Again, you know, it was whether or not it was intended or not, certainly a call to action and really being thoughtful about how do we increase diversity in the work that we are all doing, right? And so thank you again, Roland, for your time. And it was, yep. I don't, I can't think of a better segue actually to our next session. So you see a lot of the accolades going in the chat for oh. you. Thanks so much. Thanks. I, I'm, I'm going to stay on if you're not on the mind. I want to hear what my colleagues are doing in West Virginia, South Carolina, and particularly Georgia. I'm, I'm okay. interested in those. And because okay. of that, we're going to start with Georgia. How about that? <laughs> So That's you, fine. So there's some, some hand claps in our room here. So right. Okay. Thank you. All right.